Okay, good morning, everybody. Well, um, so uh, you are invited to come a little bit more forward, but you don't have to. Uh, I think there's probably two reasons that there are not so many people are here. One, I just heard there's a bug in the web app. That means that this session is scheduled in the web app at 11 o'clock. And the other one is, well, yesterday was a party. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for coming to my <clears throat> talk. I think we can just wait for those two. So, some words about me. I started with C++ in 94. I was working as a freelancer and then I got employed and we're doing medical devices uh, for women's healthcare. So for breast cancer detection. Besides that, I have some private activities. I'm blog editor of the ICCPP website. We have a very active user group in Bremen where I contribute. Then I'm a contributor to the uh, STLab concurrency library and I'm a member of the ACC conference committee. So if you have any complaints or things what we might improve, please come to, to, uh, to the other committee members or to us so, so that we can get better. And I have a lovely wife, three kids at home, and I love music. So, um, small disclaimer at the beginning. I don't know everything. And uh, there are probably mistakes that I make. But um, someone else said before, C++ language is too far, too large for anyone to master. So everyone lives within a subset. So what you now get for today is my subset. And uh, Sean Parent from Adobe said this at the CPP Now conference. OK, so why I'm here. Um, we have the problem in our application that we have to handle huge image data. So a single image takes about 2.5 gigabyte of data, and we have to consume or we have to display the radiologist uh, up to eight images at the same time. And there's a strong requirement or the promise which we make to our customers that each image change happens within less than one second, regardless how huge the image is. So, and we are not allowed to, to use any kind of fancy hardware, so we are just using standard uh, PCs. That means that we have to use the machine as much as possible. So we do many things on multiple cores. Uh, and it's easy to do mistakes. Race conditions and other problems are introduced very easily. And as well, it's easy. Sometimes it's hard to maintain the code because it's a code base which has grown now about over 20 years. Um, then in 2015, John Perrins did the CPP cast about concurrency, and I was very impressed. And I said, "Well, I think that's cool, and I, think I want to learn more." So I got in contact with him, and he was very happy to got a contributor to his uh, concurrency library. And since there, since then. I'm working there, and it makes lots of fun. And finally, I like to share my knowledge to, to others. So why are you here? So um, who has used for Stood Futures? OK, Boost Futures? OK, nearly the same. Um, has anybody already looked into the futures which come with the ST Lab? OK, fine. Uh, who thinks that futures might be something that uh, could help her or him? OK. And who thinks that he's still in the correct session? <laughs> OK. <laughs> OK, so why, would do, why do we have to talk about concurrency at all? Um, everybody knows this quote, the free lunch is over. Uh, who doesn't know the quote? Okay, then it's, it's pretty old from 2005 from Herb Sutter. And what's the main topic about this? So this is, I don't know, can you read the numbers of the years at the bottom line in the back? Okay, so this is a graph 
of number of, uh, which happened in the last, well, at least nearly 50 years in, on microprocessors. So <clears throat> this is the number of logical cores, this is the number of transistors, and the typical consum consumption of um, watts. And nearly at the time when Herb Sutter made, uh, he wrote his paper in 2005, there's a change in the graphs. The number of cores increased, but the frequency stopped. Does everybody know why you cannot go higher with the frequency? Pardon? Uh, well, that's but but we're talking about we're talking here about uh, three uh, gigahertz. So speed of light is I think far away. But there's a different there's a different reason. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, that beca that can become a problem, uh, but uh, this is uh, not the problem at the moment. Heat, power. Yeah, yes, heat, power. The main reason is you need a higher voltage if you have a higher frequency, and uh, the power consumption goes. Uh, it's related by the square of the voltage. Exactly. Yes. So there were experiments to. Uh, uh, to cool the processors extremely down, so in liquid nitrogen, but in the end there were so many other problems, so uh, that uh, manufacturers like uh, AMD and Intel went from <coughs> single core to multi core. Okay, then we have someone else. Uh, Amdahl's Law. <coughs> Everybody knows Amdahl's Law? I see not, but it's not. Not a, not a shame not to know it. Well, I, I will go in detail. So, um, Andal Snow was uh, <laughs> presented in the end of the um, 60s, and it goes as follows. So, you have this uh, quotient, and the speed up you get, uh, depending on the number of cores, goes into this formula. And uh, this is, the speed up is limita limited to the po amount of synchronization that you have. So, um, in the ideal world, so in the, in the bottom line, you see uh, each square is uh, an additional uh, core, and in the other axis, you speed up this uh, speed up. So, <clears throat> in the ideal world, if you have two cores, then you have a double of the performance. And we have three, and you have three times of the performance. Well, that's the ideal world, with 0% of synchronization. But the life is not ideal. So when you already have 10% of synchronization with your, within your application, and not within your whole system, not only within your application, in the, within the whole system, then the life already looks very different. For instance, if you have four cores, but you ha just have three times the um, the speed up. And you have more synchronization, then the things go very bad very soon. So if you have 90% synchronization, there's, uh, it doesn't make sense to put it in multiple cores at all. It's probably be faster if you use it in single core. Okay, so this is the backstory, which we have which you should have in mind for the co uh, complete session. Well, there are several ways to use multiple cores. Um, you can have individual processes uh, that they don't, which don't interact uh, with each other. That's a valid, valid concept, and for instance, companies like uh, Facebook use it, or they have used it. Uh, the last time I spoke was uh, when uh, Alexandre and Alexandrescu was at um, Facebook, so they, at certain things they don't, don't do any kind of multi-threading, uh, uh, they just use single core uh, a single process application. The next thing is um, that you have multi-threaded process without synchronization, so even if you're in the same process, you start several threads and they don't synchronize, 
So it's nearly the same with this one, but it uh, has about, uh, it works quite similar. The next step is that you need synchronization because there are certain things that you have to share between your, um, between the single uh, processes. Um, okay, there are certain techniques that you can use for synchronization. That's what, what I call, what I would call low level synchronization primitive between mutex, atomic, semaphore, transactional by mail, and so on. But that's not what I'm talking about today. I talk about high level abstractions. And there are several ones that you can use. You can use futures, you can use channels or actors. If you are interested in actors, then I recommend that you go to the next room because uh, Sega is talking about actors. <laughs> but actors and channels are a complement, so they work in a quite similar way. So, what is a future? A future is a mechanism to, to have a function, and the function returns a result, but you re separate the function from the result. So when the, function is, uh, when the fu function was executed, then the result of the function will later appear ma magically within the future. And it's not new, that's pretty old. It's from the end of the 70s, and these are the, um, the uh, Friedman, Weiss, Baker, and Hewitt uh, invent, invented this or came up to this solution. So there are some kind of building blocks that I want to mention today because a future itself does not really make sense. So you always have to combine one future uh, with something uh, with another one. So the simple thing is you have what, uh, what's called a continuation. So you have a first <coughs> uh, future. Um, then it, when, it's, uh, when the uh, task is uh, ready, then the result appears here and it goes automatically into the next future and so on. So you can make a, like a, a chain of futures. The next building block, uh, what is quite often used or what often happens, that you have two in, um, separated sources which does a certain amount of calculations and when they're ready, <clears throat> then they uh, go as an argument into this future, and this is later uh, calculated, and you get the result. Another one is a split. So you have future, you get the result, but, but two different individuals are interested in this result. So you take the result of this future and put it in this way, in this future, and in the other one. And the fourth property which I think is very interesting, it's cancellation. Imagine that you have such a graph um, of certain tasks uh, and futures. And then suddenly the user, for instance, cancels uh, a certain operation. So he's not interested in the result anymore because it takes too long or whatever. So at the end, this um, future is not interesting anymore. Well but we're using C++. So we do not want to waste our resources. We might use it for something else. So if this result is not interesting anymore, we don't have to do the calculations of this task. So, so at this point, this task is not needed anymore because there's no future attached to it. So then we come to the next point that these results are not interested anymore. So, and then the graph might collapse to something more simpler. That's what, <coughs> what we call cancellation. And I think this is an important property of the future. So, um, let's come to C++ 11 standard. So, um, the futures were added in Boost in 2009, and the Boost Futures interface were mostly uh, in this way then brought to C++ 11. It might a certain amount of differences, but uh, the basic idea and the basic uh, structure was uh, added. I, I see a shaking head. Actually, I believe it was the other way around. Okay. Boost implemented was pre-standardized, uh, but before the standard came out. 
Ah, okay. So, but it was the same order. What happened to Berlin is essentially predicted. Okay. So, uh, and then there was uh, this something I, you, you do not see when you are re read, uh, you have probably had to read all the papers and to, to follow the history. Sorry, that's my, then it's, it's my mistake, we'll uh, fix this. So, um, let's give a short overview of futures. Um, with those who sit in the back, um, I don't know, can you read the code? Yes. Okay, fine, because there will quite lots of code in this. Uh, in this session. So, um, we start with a simple uh, lambda and that just returns the answer. So then you create with async a future and in the meantime uh, you can do other things. Everybody who has read the book knows that getting the answer might take some time. And when you don't have anything uh, more to do, then you just uh, call f.get and you access the result of the task that you see. So, and then the output is 42, no surprise. Um, there's another way, um, you can as well can have, um, you can pass an argument to the task. And this is, one way is to do it with a package task. So, so in this case, um, I just ignore the possible argument, but I, I create a package task, <coughs> and uh, from the package task, I get the future, and later I pass an argument to, to the task, and I get, at this point, the same result. So, sorry, these are very dumb examples, but I just wanted to highlight the possibilities or the te uh, techniques. Bringing more complicated code is, I think, not helpful at, its, at this point. I hope that you get what I wanted to say. Um, other things is sometimes bad things happened. So, um, in case that an error happened during the calculation, um, you need uh, the, the way that, uh, the way as you have to do it, then you throw an exception. And um, the same, same way, you, so you create a future. And it is, at this point, you have to uh, enclose the get, so the access to the value with the try-catch block. Because in this case, if you call get, then the um, exception that you have thrown during the calculation is then re-thrown in the get and then you can uh, access it. So this is a way of transferring exceptions one from one thread to the other thread. Isn't, there is no other way to do it. Because leaving the exception out of the calculation is a very bad idea because this will kill your thread. Or it might even kill your application. It's a little dependent on what uh, your um, compiler is doing with these things. I think in the past, in, in Visual Studio, they just the thread killed and it was lost. I think today it's required that the uh, application is terminated. Or I'm looking into, I think it's, it has to, uh, has to terminate. Uh, it has to call it to terminate. Okay. Um, this code has a problem when a goal is that you want to use your CPU in the best way. Dot get is a blocking call. So your process stuck until the result is there. So if this calculation or what you have do, is, are doing in the meantime that is shorter than what the calculation of the future is, then you just wait and you are, cannot do anything. So um, unfortunately, there is no direct way to checking if the future is ready, so if the result is already there. You just can do it with an indirect way. Um, you have to call dot wait for, and the argument with zero seconds, and then you get a result if it's timed out or if it, uh, the result is not timed out. And from there you can deduce, ah, this result is ready. I think this should be improved in any way so that you have a direct access. Is the result ready or not? 
So let's have a look at the capabilities of the C++11 uh, C++ futures, what we have 11, 14, and, and 17. Uh, we have no continuation. We just have a single future. We have no join. No when all, no when any. We have no split. We have no cancellation. But there are ways to model it. In the bottom is a URL how to make up a piece of uh, Sean Parent uh, created some uh, way how it's still possible to do uh, cancellation. Um, so there's no reduction. What I mean with reduction? Um, so if the result of your, um, of your fu uh, future is again a future, then it would be very nice if this collapse to the value itself so that you don't um, so that you don't get to shut things at the future of future of future. So this is, would be very nice. So if you, um, if inside the graph uh, you get a future of futures as a result, then it automatically sh should collapse to just a single future. Um, there's no way of, sorry? If, if there's a question, please, please uh, come to me and interrupt and uh, I will, I'm glad to uh, answer uh, all the questions, or if I'm not clear enough, or whatever. So there's no progress mod monitoring inside the futures itself. You have to build it by your, uh, own, uh, yourself. Um, there's no way to use custom executor. Uh, Volker did a talk two days ago about possible ways or a solution of executor, so I will not go into the detail here. Um, as well, the future blocks on destruction. So if you are not interested in the future anymore, you still have to wait uh, until the, uh, just a second. If the task already has started, you still have to wait until the result is there. If the, st uh, if the start uh, task has not started, then it's allowed, as far as I remember, to, um, to end immediately. You're shaking your hand? The real problem is that it only blocks on destruction if the future comes from an AC. If it comes from a set of tasks or from a promise, then it doesn't block. Okay. You actually have the same type but with two different behaviors on the destructor okay. depending on where you get into the future. Okay. Thank you very much. So, um, and future does get has two problems. So, uh, <clears throat> we already talked about this. And it's very easy to uh, introduce by this deadlocks as well. Yes? Well, what would it mean to have a split of the thing? Can we have a shared futures? I'm, I'm coming to this uh, a little bit later, OK? OK. Um, and as well, you're blocking everything which uh, might uh, come in there. And as well, futures don't behave as a regular type. The, the meaning of regular type is known to you or not? If you, if you don't know what's regular type, okay. So um, it's, it's a term that I don't know who's, who coined the word, uh, the term, but it's, uh, um, it came from uh, Alexander, um, Alexander Stepanov's uh, book, Elements of Programming, where he defines that um, a type is a regular type if you had a copy constructor as an uh, equal uh, operator. And uh, Yes, these are, I think these are properties. Yes, a default constructor, copy constructor, assignment operator, and equal and unequal operator. So that's what he called a regular type. So, okay, let's have a look into the boost future. Boost futures have continuations. So, and they're realized with a dot then. So if the first thing is ready, then it automatically goes to the next one without waiting. So in this case, uh, the code looks like this. We have Again, we have the um, calculation or the creation of um, to calculate the answer. And later, we want to report the answer. There might be someone interested in the result. So we create with Boost Async um, a future. And then we concatenate the future and pass the second uh, function object to it. And then this will report the answer when it's ready. So this done, done wait, wait, waits until the second future is ready. 
So at least we have the possibility to build some kind of uh, minimal oil, minimal graphs. Other thing is join. There are two ways of join commonly used. The one is when all. So then you have multiple futures which are running it probably independently. And when all of them ready, the arguments go into uh, the continuation. The other one is when any. So for instance, you have three futures, and they are all um, um, joined with when any. So when the first future of the three is ready, so on, or for, if this is ready, then it goes auto, uh, automatically into the continuation, regardless if this is ready or not. So yeah. how is this realized and used? So you have, um, sorry, and you have, at this time you have two processes or uh, two functions which does a certain calculation and you create a future of them, and with when all, you move the first and the second one into the when all, and you pass then the result into a third one, and this is then the combined, or the joint result. Okay, so far? Okay, so then we get again the answer. Uh, trick question. What is the type of F? Future, future, future. Yes. A future tuple of futures. So this is the complete type. And I have to admit, I don't like this. So it's my personal view. I think it's quite complicated. And it makes a problem on this function. So you really need a function that takes this kind of argument. Or you have to put something in between that unwraps all this uh, future and tuple stuff. I think it would be much nicer if this, uh, um, if this function takes, for instance, in this case, just two simple arguments. So without kind of this features. OK, let's just uh, see on the possibilities of uh, what we got with the C++ 17TS and boost. So we have, dot that, we have continuations, we have when all and when any. We have no split, no cancellation, no reduction, and no progress monitoring. But we have something what I would call a custom executor. They're perhaps not perfect, but there is something in it. But it still may block on destruction, and all the other problems, or what I see as a problem, is still there. And the seven, um, C++ 7 T, uh, TS, it's uh, in an experimental namespace. So mixing both is not a good idea, or even it doesn't work. OK, but now we come to the title of my talk. There is a new future. Um, it's on the STLab website. STLab stands for Software Technology Lab. That was a science, uh, or it was an organization within Adobe in the 80s, or sorry, in the 90s, and they did amount of cool stuff in there. And uh, they, some years ago, they published their complete source code into open source, and it's on the GitHub available. But this is just now for, uh, for the concurrency. So let's have a look at the capabilities. Of course, we have continuations. We have joins, we have splits, we have cancellation, we have reduction. Progress monitoring is on our schedule, but it's not there so far. We have custom ex executors. We do not block on destruction. We do never block on, on destruction. We behave as a regular type. And the dependencies, if you're using C14, you, use, you have to use, or you have to include boost optional. If you use C17, just none. There's no de other dependencies. It just works with C17. Let's have a look. Um, you need a certain amount of includes. I will just uh, remove them now for clarity uh, in the uh, in the, on the next slide. As well, you have an. Um, a, a task that you want to, you want to calculate the answer. Uh, sorry, no, I jump to the top. 
and you create not with stud async or boost async, so in this case with stlab async, you create the future, you pass, in this case you can, uh, pa or you have to pass an executor. Um, the default executor is on Windows and Mac OS, it's which comes from the operating system, so probably the best one which is possible on that platform. Uh, as well, we support Pinnacle and oh, I think two or three more uh, op um, the thread pools from which come from the operating system. For, op uh, for systems like, uh, like Linux, which don't have a thread pool by itself, we provide one which is uh, highly optimized. So it's this uh, task stealing thread pool. And if you want to know more about this, I can recommend Sean Perron's talk he gave at uh, Coach dive, I think, two years ago. They it really goes into the, all the details how to, how to implement this. And then you pass in uh, the Lambda, and this then re <coughs> returns then the future of int. And now here's something different. Um, we don't have, <coughs> you can, you do, you do not have to wait or you do not have, do, do not block if you try to ask if, it's, uh, the, if the result is there. So, no, but you just say get try, and this returns true, or it returns an optional, and this optional then uh, is converted to a bool, and it, if it's true, then you have the result, otherwise it's false. And you can do something in meaningful. But of course, I, this is just for illustration, please do not program with these busy waiting loops do something meaningful in the meantime. For instance, use continuation or something else. But this is just for illustration, because all these examples are real code that I was wanted to be that it really compiles and works. I hate, uh, well, no, I, I don't like slides where are syntactic problems so that later when you look into it, well, it doesn't work. So that's the reason that sometimes on my slides these uh, not meaningful find it. So, and then you just <clears throat> call get try dot value, and again, the result is 42. Um, we got requests from users that they want a blocking get, as we have it in std futures or boost futures. So then we don't add it as a member function, but we, for us it's an external <coughs> function which really says what it means. It's a blocking get. So you, if you use it, it blocks your application at that point, and you wait. Okay, um, as well, we have uh, capabilities of error handling. Um, here, bad things can happen as well. And the same as before of with Booth. And <clears throat> In this case, again, you have to encapsulate this with the try-catch block, and it will rethrow the exception which was caught when you uh, access the get try. So if the result is, just a second, if the, if the result is there and it's an exception, then it will automatically rethrow the exception. Yes, please. Uh, I was just going to ask a question about the previous slides. Yes, of course. So this one? Yes, but this, this comes, comes on the next slide because this is, uh, for this you need, uh, you use continuation. So when the result is ready, then you do something else. So, and this is the same true. If something failed, then go on. Yes. Uh, what happens with uh, thrown exceptions if you use get try, so try get, or what was the function like in the previous slide? Uh, like whether the, uh, like, are there also options? So, yeah, yes, that's a thing. You're right. So <clears throat> at this point, if you just see this line without this one, there are two possible exceptions that might come out. So one is uh, the exception from your task that got rethrown. The other one is if you access an optional without a value inside, then you get, an, an, I, I, sorry, I forgot the name, uh, the, the uh, exact name of optional, but it's something like unset value or something uh, similar. So then, then you get this one, yeah? Yes. Does that imply that the result has to be copyable? 
Um, no. No. Um, no, 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 it returns an optional. Um, but uh, yes, yes, uh, but yes. You, you, you question. So we support uh, move only and copyable uh, and copyable types. And of course, you can uh, use a get try just on a move only type just once, because in this case you have it inside your uh, inside the optional. Okay. okay. So, so does get try return an optional with the non-reference type? So in this case, optional is. Uh, in this case, it uh, yes. <clears throat> in, in, since this is uh, the result is uh, copyable, it returns a copy of the result. Okay. So if we had a move only type, type, then this code would be broken in the sense that if we the real result in, in the while loop to execute the while loop, then the result will be gone by the time we but the print. Yes. Okay. And then the, the first get try that starts the real optional, like the result, it will return an empty option. Uh, so you'll, 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 uh, you'll try to get the value uh, in each iteration of the loop, and uh, uh, when the value will be available, like either it's a uh, 42 words an exception, then, then get drive will return this value, and uh, from now on, you have no guarantees what the next location of get drive will return. If it's a move only type, yeah. No, if the move, in case of a move only type, then you, of course, you can just get it once because it moves the, type, uh, the value out of the future because out of the future into the optional. But if it's a copyable type, you get always the same value because it's a copy table and it will be copied at that point. So you can call multiple times, uh, get try if the future is ready, and you always get the same, uh, same result. Okay, so we have, we, uh, yeah, we got this, and then we uh, try, again, that's the same. Uh, yeah. Okay, now we come to the <clears throat> continuation. Um, I think this answers a little bit more. Uh, your question, so <clears throat> you, you have your function that uh, uh, does the calculation, which might take longer, and then you uh, have another one which then accepts this uh, result, and then you, you create your first future, and then conti continue on a second future. And the difference between boost future, stood future, and the STLab future, that here, this is a call by value. It's not a call by future. <laughs> Automatically, the hand's going up. Yes, please. Um, so where is the exception going? One. Just okay. one or two slides further. Ah, OK. So, um, <clears throat> so and then we, adjust, then we get the same output. Um, I just came to the error handling in a second. First, I want to give an ex uh, example of uh, the reduction. So I just go from, from the inside to the outside because I think it's a little bit better to read. So you have something that, you have a function object that returns a future itself. In this case, it uh, just has an async and it returns the, the in your future. This is then passed into a continuation, for instance. And this continuation is attached to a different future. It might happen. But then the result for us is just a future of int. Otherwise, if we have no reduction, it would be a future of future of int. So any exception will be propagated to the... Yes, of course. Yeah. Yes, of course. But I have to admit, at the moment, we just support a reduction for copyable types. We don't support it so far for move-only types, because this is a little bit tricky to implement this. 
and up to now I have not found a solution. I, perhaps it's possible, I don't know if it's possible, up so far uh, we have not, uh, I have not found a solution for this. Okay, so and then you can c continue on this result and you again got uh, past just an int and not a future of future of int. Okay, so then we have come to the problem of error handling. Yes? Uh, just again, a question about the previous slide. Yeah. It's not like two different uh, futures here. Uh, you have to say that the error handling is different from the previous one. That depends on your arguments that you pass here. In this case, if you have it on, the, if you use the default executor, which is implemented for us on the thread pool, so there's no guarantee where it's executed. So it may be the same thread, but uh, you should not rely on this. It really then takes uh, on the thread pool, it's, the next task is spawned on the, uh, or is run, it's executed on the thread pool, and there it uh, then starts. More question, yes? Yes. Well, for completion, the next one would already start. It's really going into the queue with all the others to see when it's, it's done to, to be processed. Uh, yes. So at the moment, we have, we have no uh, way to uh, pull or prioritize. Uh, the things on the thread pool, yes. That's, I know that is, is, uh, is, so these things are proposed, and there are, um, but this is something what we don't have so far, but it's on our plan to implement. Yes? No, I, I think the real question was, um, well, the plan essentially is invoked when, uh, when the future is ready. Yes. So the future was set by somebody who, in most cases, probably is, has just finished. So the continuation could just run on that thread uh, that could use the registration <coughs> of the future. Um, I know and understand what you mean, uh, but we, um, one might use here something, but this could have other bad implications on, your, on, your, uh, on the performance. So that could, could mean that if you then continue all your, uh, if it, all your continuations on the same thread, it may be that other uh, threads or the other cores or other tasks that you, uh, other points and other parts of your application uh, put into the thread pool uh, don't get, get really a, a chance of uh, proceeding. Yes. Yeah. I completely agree. The, the question is, do you have any options to control this? Yes. The yes. Um, in this case, um, you don't have to. Uh, in a, um, uh, let me see. I think yes. Here, in this example, here in the continuation, I don't pass an executor. So in this case, it will automatically use the same executor as before. And if you want to guarantee that it's running on this, in the same thread uh, without uh, be spawned on the thread pool, then you can use on, the, on this future what we call an immediate executor, so that it's guaranteed that it's automatically just a function call into the next one, if you want to do this. Okay? Uh, I will come a little bit later to the different kind of uh, executors that we provide. So now we come to the problem of error recovery. So <clears throat> we, have, uh, we calculate our answer, and since it takes very long, it might bad things happen. Um, then I have another one uh, which is capable of handling the answer. This is just a very primitive example. So um, now we do it a little bit different than perhaps others. So uh, in this case, we just create our first future, and then we don't call dot then, but we call dot recover. 
It's a different function. And this, in this case, takes a future as an argument for error handling. So in this case, the, uh, the interface is similar to what is in Boost or uh, in the standard. But for all the cases, there are many uh, situations where no threads can be thrown, because if you just have the simple calculation. And for those, we do not want to put the burden on the, the uh, developer to handle these more complicated things. If you have the problem that there are exceptions might arise, you can use this one, this interface. But for the, all the other cases, you don't have to, to use a complicated interface, but a more simpler one. You just <coughs> accept the value by uh, the, um, the argument as value. Yes? And if you don't provide a recover, um, where is the exception thrown? Um, Especially if you give an executor to the dot pen. Um, in this case, uh, wait. Well, the most logical thing to me would be that whatever future comes out at the end will yeah. yes. present this exception. Yes. Because the exception is, is kind of agnostic to what, what type the future has and can be passed to any future. Yeah, and then the so exception is. Whatever you have in the end can have. Can have yeah, the, exactly. Yeah. So many ways for if if the if the if the uh, let let me separate things. If the future goes off, uh, out of scope, it uh, will, will automatically immediately be destructed, and uh, any kind of exception will be uh, kept inside, so it will not go outside, and it, and the result is gone. So this is a little bit surprising if you start imp using with these futures. Um, because it's very easy to make the mistake that the future goes out of scope. So then you, re uh, where's my result? Nothing's happening. Why is, why is this function not even called? Because the future's already gone. So this is a property of cancellation, so <clears throat> that the result is, um, it will be, if it has not started, then it will not, uh, will not start, it, and it's really just the destruction of the, of the future. But if the uh, calculation has already started, then it will, of course, finish. We will not kill or cancel it. But there's all attached continuation will not be called, and the result which is just thrown on the floor. And the exception itself will also be emitted? Like no, in this case, the exception will not emit. The exception is gone, because you destructed already its future. You cannot access the fashion. You're not interested in it anymore. Why, why do you want to um, catch it or give it to your user. I think that was a question before. Uh, in case cancellation is happening, yeah. the result would be able to go out of scope. Uh, you say if, if the task is already stopped, if the screen will allow it to continue, are there any uh, mechanisms foreseen that within the task you could hold something to see a cancellation was requested? Because maybe your calculation... I know what you mean. Yes, I know what you mean. Uh, we have it on the plan to implement. This is something which is connected to progress monitoring. So this is so the uh, progress monitoring is in one direction, so that you inform your user. Uh, so we're already in one percent, ten percent, a hundred percent, depending where you are. And the vice versa is the question: is maybe I already terminate or end, uh, abort my calculation? This is an uh, uh, agenda to implement, but it's not there so far. Ready with the exception. Is that cool? Yes. Okay. So I've to look a little bit on my uh, on, on the time. Okay. So I think we covered this. This. Yes. Now we come to a join. Um, so we have two futures. They 
said, for instance, you have a very complicated uh, calculation, and it's easy to put it on two different, uh, uh, it's easy to separate it into two individual tasks, so you can start them um, individually, and you can join them with the when all because you're interested of both results. And then you pass a normal function which takes just one, the real values as argument and not the, um, uh, not a future as an argument. And then you continue and uh, so. And in this case, the arguments go in as an L value, so there's no move into it. That's very important. That's the difference to boost into the standard. Why this is important comes a little bit later. Okay, and then we have the same answer. Okay, now we came to the next point. Yes? Well, of course, in this case, it can happen that both of the original functions show an exception. So we have more than one exception. Mm -hmm. So what happens now? Uh, very good question. Um, so, uh, as a first addition, we, don't, we have two kinds of when all. The one is with when all with as argument, and the other one is uh, and the, when you use this one, uh, you have to know, to know at compile time how many futures you want to join. There is another one so that you can pass um, a range so that it takes an arbitrary number of uh, futures that have to, um, you want to com uh, compute and then uh, con to continue. Um, we implemented it in that way, so when, as soon as the fir a first exception occurs and when all, all the other uh, futures will be cancelled, so we try to cancel them. Of course, if they are already running, there's no way to do it. Uh, there's nothing what you can do, but we try to do it because in this case, we think there's no, it does not make sense to compute all the other stuff. It might be very long. If, for instance, you have, you have an um, array of uh, hundreds of futures, it doesn't make sense when you really need all the uh, all your results. And vice versa, if you have a when any, a uh, certain amount of exceptions might happen. But we continue until the very last. And if the very last throws as well, of course, then we fail. But uh, we continue as long as uh, there's still one future ongoing or there might be running uh, so that it's, there's still a start sorry, still a chance that uh, the, when any might um, become or could be fulfilled. Yeah? Well, the um, proposal that is part of the concurrency here um, led that it's in a very complicated way using tuples or arrays or vector. Uh, but the upside of that is that you have complete control here. You know exactly which uh, uh, task uh, saw an exception and which didn't and so on. And uh, so you get full control with a lot of inconvenience. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have the more convenient option, but it's you also have an option to get the full control. Um, yes. I th of course, we have certain kind of compromises. We, we don't have, in all corners, uh, as the proposal, the way to control the things. That's true. But um, at least that's what we are using today, and it works. So uh, <clears throat> they, use, uh, these, uh, um, they use these features in Photoshop and uh, in several of their products and quite successful. So, and uh, we are at, at the moment in, in the process to integrate these features into our software as well. So, um, at least now, we ha all our requirements could be fulfilled with this. Yes, Martin. Uh, if you use Recover on AMP, then you can inspect what you get and turn it into a type that you can then pass on that surfaces whatever information you need. So, if you took yeah. the variant of your value or that and transfer the knowledge into you. Yes, you're right. So yeah. there's a way out. Yeah, that's true. Okay, now we come to the split. I think a split is very, very important because it's, uh, it's a kind of symmetry. So I like symmetric interfaces. So we have to join several ways, go into something, 
and there's definitely use cases where you have that several things can go out of it. <clears throat> so for instance, one thing might be storing a result on the disk and the other one update the GUI. Typical, from my point of view, typical uh, example for, for a split. So what we do is the continu uh, multiple continuations on the same future. How do we, how do we do this? So we have our first one which calculates our answer. So then the first one is uh, we want to report this result to Arthur Dent. The next one, we want to share up Marvin. So then we just simple answer dot then of the first one and do it on the other, other one. And then we continue in, might continue in two different directions. Yes? And not from my point of understanding. A shared future allows calling multiple gets on the same value, uh, on, the, on the same. Uh, but it, as I understood, it's not possible to do uh, multiple continuations. Somebody knows why? why because the future, because the continuation, as Correct me, I'm wrong. But the continuation accepts them as an R value, so the, the, so the future is moved into the, uh, into, uh, the result is moved into the continuation. If you, if you look into the interface of dot then, as far as I'm said, uh, uh, it, uh, it accepts the value as an R value. Um, of course, this can only work with copyable arguments. So, <clears throat> there's. Yes, your compiler is telling it you. Because it is implemented in the, that way that you on move only types you can just there's no way to implement uh, to to program a split. The compiler will tell you that it's it, it will, it's a bug. Okay. So if it's a copyable table, you can split in whatever direction you want. But if you do it on a move-only type, you just can one continuation at the other one. You can, it, it's not possible. How does the compiler detect on line 11 that line 10 also for the continuation? Um, I can go, we, we, this is a question I can answer you, but it will take a lot, much more time. And I'm, I'm already a little bit out of time. And uh, so if you do it, the compiler, or the, the, uh, it's implemented in the way, so there are different impl uh, implementation way, um, parts. So one is for copy, move for void, one is for move only, one for copyable. And so these different things uh, then guarantee it's via the implementation that it's not possible. Okay? We can, I, I, can, I, I can try to answer you, but I would try to move this a little bit out of um, this, uh, this talk. Okay. Yeah, then there are two blockings. So um, these are two blockings are not very nice, I think. But we can do it better. We can combine them because now we have the complete tool set. So we have the same program as before. We have these two futures. But now, we combine them with when all. So when both have accepted the answer, then we continue. So this is a combination of a split and join. OK, this is the when all at this point. So at this point, it fits very nice together. Now we came to executors. So far, <clears throat> I just had on the slide the, what we call a default executor. Executors are needed to customize where and how your, where your task shall be executed. There are possible, a huge variety of possible executors, so thread pools, zero queues, main queues, task groups, and so on. So um, standard executors come hopefully with C++ 10, 20, but what I heard uh, by uh, Detlef, it's maybe that it's just coming with 23. Uh, in Boost, the executors drive, as for, for my knowledge, from a common base class. Maybe they have changed in the recent version, but I've, I've not looked into it. 
Uh, in SPLab, the, you just have to implement the call operator, and that's all. So what we have so far, it's the default executor, the immediate executor, which is just, it immediately calls the next one. Then we have a main executor for Mac OS um, and for one other, it's not for, for, for Windows available, so it, it uh, executes a certain task in the main loop of the application. And then we have a system timer so that you can um, execute a task at a certain time, of course, in the future. So, um, in the, at the end of uh, the slides, there's an example how to implement your own executor, and the example that I provide is to do it in the Qt main loop, although well, that's what we use in our application, so that's very useful. Um, but it's, uh, it goes beyond uh, what I can do. In this. So, this is just an illustration example. This is more or less really nonsense code, because this really doesn't work. I just want to illustrate what um, how different execu uh, you can compose different ex executors. So at the end, you have a line edit that you want to update when a certain result is there. So again, we calculate our, uh, our answer, and we have continuation. And this continuation is not executed on the default executor, but on the, what I just called as a QT executor. So which is a custom executor, which then executes the continuation in the main loop. Because updating the GUI outside of the main loop is not very wise in, on many platforms. You get very funny results. So, <clears throat> so in this case, on the thread pool, you, you do a calculation for 42, and then this is passed into the main loop, and there you update your GUI element. Okay. So what we plan in the, very, in the near future, so our code team support is already implemented. We're just in the process on releasing it. We plan certain performance optimization, as already uh, said, uh, progress monitoring, which will be uh, something what we add in task promotion so that you can uh, control, have more control about the execution on the, on the tasks. Yeah. Um, the code team The one which, uh, which are currently, yeah, it's not boost coroutines, but they are currently available in Visual Studio and on Clang. So our implementation works on Clang 6.1, I think, uh, and uh, on Visual Studio 2013 and later. And as soon as GCC has implemented them, I will see that it works for them as well. Or it's, it's capable or available, available for them as well. So the conclusion, um, I think Future is a great tool to track the, yes? No, no, definitely not. Um, and there, we don't plan to do it because it can, we have, we have the, those from the standard and so on. Um, so I think futures are a great tool to structure your code in a good readable manner, so no kind of, uh, uh, sorry, I have to uh, go in a different way. If you can do something similar with callbacks, but callbacks have, from my point of view, the big disadvantage that it's hard to read, hard to follow your call, how the code, how, how the, really the execution goes through the application. And I think it's much easier to do it with continuations. So first do this, then do that, and then do that. And they have the advantage to can change the few, or you can change your graph within the execution. This is not possible with callbacks. And the, a callback graph has to be set up in advance, otherwise it, it does not work. But with, with features, you can uh, attach continuations during the, already the execution is running. It's no problem. Okay. But this graph is for single, for single use only. So you set it up, you can use it once, and that's all. And for the next calculation, you have to set, set, set up it again. So channels are one concept that supports multiple executions, so multiple doing the same thing multiple times. It's quite, um, yeah, it's a, a trans allow way to the graph that can be reused. Um, 
pretty old as well. It's a great book by Tony Hoare. I can recommend very well. So another way of illustrating it at the channel. So you have you can think as, as a pipe. On one end, you send something into it. And at the end of the pipe, there's something which can do certain calculations before it goes further on. For instance, you can add, attach certain pipes uh, like you can do it with real water pipes. You can you do splits, joints, and all these things. So uh, you can build graphs of this as well. Um, So, um, yeah, something I have to explain because this is completely, completely new. Um, you have to create a sender. So this is the instance which then accepts the value so that you want to put into the channel. You have to create the other end of the pipe. In this case, we call it a receiver. And then you have to join them together into a channel. So. There are ways to write this nicer with C17, but uh, our library works with C14, so this is the way uh, as to, uh, you want to have to write it. Um, so. And, so, and then we come, then we want to, we want to do anything, we want to do something with the result. At this point, we attach what I just called a printer, so this is just thing which takes the result and prints it to the console. So, and then we take this receiver and pipe the printer to it. So then the result, so then the values go via send in the receiver and the receiver pipe them to the printer. So um, at this point you have to tell the graph that it's ready. So that it's now ready to work. So that you have defined start. In this, uh, so, and then, then you just send three values into it Just scroll a little bit up, and then you have three outputs. Of course, this is a very dumb and simple example. Yes, please. Uh, why do we need this? Like, is that really like at all? Like, uh, what if I have like, a runtime condition where I accept some types of pipes, but some types do not? Like, do I need to call set ready every time I pop the pipe or something additional to an existing um, The point is. Um, We need. The, we think it's uh, important to have this have some kind of. It's, well, it's not, it's not synchronization point in the in the in the sense of multi-threading, but to make definitely now this is ready to proceed, and when you have set uh, if you have set this receiver to ready, you technically you could uh, delete this one. It's not needed anymore. Okay. So you could this could go could go out could go out of scope, and it's internally, with the ref counting, it's still there. OK. OK. Um, of course, we can do a split. And this is done with a concatenation with pipe operator on the same receiver, more or less the same with two dot then on the future. So um, now it's. Uh, C17 syntax with a structured binding, it makes the things a little, a little bit nicer to read. And we have two processes that we want to attach because the, those twos are interesting in the result. So we attach them both, and then we set the receiver to ready. After this, you cannot attach it anymore. Then you get an exception, this is an error. Of course, this only works with copyable types. If you want to do it with move-only types, your compiler will give you a very nasty error message. <laughs> I'm just sorry, error message is in this library and not nice. It's, 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 it's a huge template uh, stuff which is under the hood, and the error messages are really, um, when you have to learn to read them. Is this a question? Uh, so, yeah. That one is done 
the... Yes, it will not get any more, uh, get, it will not get uh, any value. So it's, it's like uh, with cancellation. It's, it's the same uh, here. Yes, but in this case, what you what you just proposed is a different graph. It's a continuation, so you can uh, you uh, you can have mul multiple pipes, uh, whatever you want. So there's no we you don't have to. Um, so, sorry, in this case you. Uh, no, that's not possible. You have to do it in. Uh, in separate because it really goes into uh, in separate ways and the printer B if you pay if you make with a pipe and this one then it would be a continuation on this one but you wanted to do a continuation on this one okay that's a good idea but we use and for something different <laughs> I'm come to I'm coming to this a little bit later yes Um, no, if you, if, you, if you call the destructor on the, on the feeding end, nothing happens. You have to call the destructor on the receiving end. Then the complete graph is destructed. You, so you can start turning down the channel from, from the upstream if you don't want to send it anymore. Um, but the end of the, gra the graph itself uh, will be uh, still there. Only when you destroy the last receiver in this direct graph, then the rest uh, will, uh, then the, comp the graph will be destroyed. Okay, cool. Yeah. Could you pause and resume? Pardon? Pause and resume? So uh, well, that's up to you. That's up to, um, there, are different, there are different things what you could do. And um, not in this simple model, but I come when certain slides later there you have more pos more flexibility what you can do within your graph because these are very simple processes that you just can attach so um, as a join we have um, <clears throat> join so uh, several th several results must be at the same time and then you proceed we have what is called zip so um, so that it uh, takes the results from different receivers in some uh, round robin manner, uh, manner. So the first one, then the second one, the third one, and then proceed it down them. Or we have a merge so that in one order they came, they just go in, from several sources into one. Um, I, we all get feedback that the naming is not optimal and we intend to change it, <laughs> to, uh, which is used uh, in other areas as well, especially with the zip. This is, uh, uh, we got a feedback that it's a little bit confusing as it is done in uh, other uh, platform or in other uh, frameworks and then we, we intend to change this. And I, I, but I don't, want, I don't have yet examples for this one. So um, now we come to the uh, un, uh, end operator. So with, uh, if you can connect, concatenate them, uh, including with, for instance, with a buffer size, you can limit the amount of values which are just waiting on a, on a single process, so that you can have the control how uh, how many um, objects uh, are then accu accumulating in a, in a certain part of the of your pipeline, and you have as well the possibility to um, define on which executor a certain part of your graph uh, is been executed. Um, for all of this, we have lots of examples on the website uh, I w uh, in the documentation, um, but I w will not uh, show them uh, here because this is a little bit beyond. So, um, but sometimes you have other requirements. Sometimes your processes that you want to execute have state that, that they want to keep after each execution or you have a relationship of n inputs but m outputs. So different kind of uh, in and outputs. This cannot be done with the current, with just a simple function object. Um, 
Otherwise, as well, there are things uh, when to proceed. It may be that it takes, that by, by sudden, no results come anymore, uh, anymore from upstream, but you still want to handle it in an appropriate way. So you need some kind of control with timings. Um, and this is something what we then do with uh, what I called a stateful uh, process. In this case, you have to attach something a little bit different, not just a function object, but an object of this signature. Or it, it must implement these functions. So we don't do any kind of, uh, we have some uh, base class and then you have to overwrite certain functions. Um, if you have seen Sean Perrin's talks, inheritance is the base of all evil because of that. We just, you have to implement these functions and it's not very complicated. So, um, you have to implement an await function. So, whenever uh, a new value comes from upstream, it is uh, passed into the await function. And um, this is just a pseudo template. It depends how many uh, upstream senders do you have. You just have one. Of course, this function must only have one argument. If you have two or three upstream sender, then this should be, uh, have uh, the corresponding number of arguments. Um, when the result is ready, then um, the framework calls the yield function. So then it, it's, then it expects a value from this process so that it uh, can proceed with a, uh, with a value. And when, when does it happen? It depends on the state. So you have to provide a state function. So this can, be, can mean a wait forever. So it really accepts one value after the other one. And if it's ready, then it changed, or then your process have to change to yield, to yield immediately, and then immediately the result is taken and then piped downstream. You can close um, if you want your process. So you can signal to your process that the upstream is uh, collapsing or that uh, you already started to destroy your upstream then uh, this, is, uh, cl this um, close function is called, so that can signal your process, no, you are going to go, uh, you are going to do, uh, go down. Or you can, uh, can pass an exception if an exception happens on the way downstream. But these are optional, you don't have to implement them. Okay, um, simple example. Just imagine we have something which, we, which I call an adder, so it just adds certain values until, uh, until a certain point. And we, we come to the implementation in a, in a second. So we, have our, we set up our channel and we um, pipe our adder on our receiver and when we are done, we want to print out the uh, res uh, uh, result. So what is this small program doing? So it w accepts uh, values. You should just type in numbers. Uh, and then it sends the values down, downstream. And that's uh, forever. So let's have a look at the adder, so which is now the stateful process which is attached to your receiver. At the beginning, our sum is zero, and our state is we wait forever until the new value is coming. So what we're doing in await, we just accept the value, add it to the so far received values, and now is here the terminating or the switch condition. If somebody added a zero on a keyboard, then it will say, no, okay, I now want to um, go on and uh, pipe the values or uh, push the values downstream. It's just for this example. You're in, in your own application, you, of course, you will make something more meaningful. At this point, you change the state to yield immediate, and then the framework will call your process on yield, and you should return a result. And then you, in this case, you probably change your state back to, so that it, uh, it's ready to accept new values. Okay, so the channel cl close the gap, which futures just provide a single graph, but we have uh, things which you want to do multiple uh, um, calculations on and on in uh, setting up such a graph is, can be quite expensive in the meaning of uh, resources. So it's easy to set up a graph. Uh, you have similar possibilities. Okay. 
Um, Takeaway so far. Um, use high-level abstraction for your code. Channels, actors, or whatever. Try to avoid using mutex and all, all this low-level synchronization stuff. It's so easy to make mistakes, even if you're doing it already for a long time. And it's, the risk that you introduce performance penalties is really very easy. Don't implement your own threat pool. It's hard stuff. It's really hard to do a very good and very fast threat pool. And uh, if your operating system like macOS or Windows offers a threat pool, use it. So um, use it in your own application if you want, don't want to use uh, ours, but you can look into, uh, into the code, it's on GitHub, and get an idea how to, how to use the system thread pools, which are, have just the C interface, how to put on it, uh, on top of it, a C++ interface, which can be uh, nicely used. <coughs> or, if you want one, you can use our thread pool, it's highly optimized, and uh, yes, for instance, works on Linux very well. Um, when you design your application, just a hint from my side, design it in a way that it's deadlock-free even if you just have one core. That can be very, very hard. But only then you can guarantee that it's deadlock-free on a two, three, or four core machine. As well, I recommend Sean Perrin's talk at um, um, uh, Coach Dive in Brocklove. Uh, I think from two years ago. It's a great talk about this problem, where they're accounted within Photoshop, what they have learned there. So don't let Utex, Atomics, and Threads be soaked into your impli uh, impli uh, application. So I have to thank, at the end, uh, so my family that supports me when I'm sitting there and working on, on the library. Sean Parent, who taught me lots of things. He's a really nice guy and he gave me permission to whatever I, he used in his presentation, I can use it, my company that I can work here, and all the contributors to the library. Um, in the end, there's a um, certain amount of things where you're interested in, you can look further. There are certain papers that others have written regarding uh, the futures for the standard, or the papers that we have written, or um, great books I can, highly can recommend um, other Libraries, for instance, HPX from the Stellar Group. There's another um, CSP framework so that uh, offers channels. There's an actor framework, which is very nice. A great book by Anthony Williams, which I think just got available in the second edition. I highly recommend if you're interested in the low-level details. Um, further viewing uh, um, presentation by Sean Parent and, uh, for instance, Kevin Henney. Uh, thinking outside, outside the synchronization quadrant is a very good talk with great devices. So, that's it so far. Here's a place where you can look for everything and uh, experiment, use it, give us feedback. Thank you very much. <laughs> More questions? Ah. Yes, that's the way is to do it. Okay. Yep. Uh, regarding the, the split uh, the shared future, um, so as far as I understand, the then consumes the future on the left. Is that correct? Uh, sorry, could you repeat? The, the then uh, function consumes the future on the left, also for shared future. That was my understanding. Okay. But in this case, that's the case. Uh, I think it's, it's, I can imagine that you can save one reference count, maybe, but it's, uh, it's not. Yeah. Other questions? Um, you had different options on the channel join. Yes. Do you also have uh, different options on the split? 
uh, what do you have in mind? So for example, you're deciding whether you want uh, to have a single value that, that comes in and you split going to only a single one of the one that followed or to all of them. You said to put you uh, send them to all of them, but for some applications it might yeah, be I know what you mean. that they don't make one. Um, interesting interesting problem. I think you can realize it uh, or could realize it through um, a stateful process. But it uh, might be, become a bit tricky so that you have full control to which is actually going. Um, but uh, I will take it back and we will rethink if it's uh, tr to add this uh, kind of possibility. If it's not possible to do it in a safe and or meaningful way with a stateful process. Yes? Yes. Does it, uh, does it actually try and uh, construct like a proper um, uh, one big type with all the like with all the call operators in it? Like if you know the uh, before you will be talking essentially about the C. Yes. Uh, like, uh, that's what he did. And it yeah. works great because in, in your case, you pretty much force center, like you, you force to set ready after you finish. But this is. Uh, that, that's not true. It may be you can uh, compose your graph during runtime. No. Yes, but at the very end. But uh, what you attach in the in between until you said ready, that is up to you to uh, uh, to runtime. Yes. I have to admit, I did not look into the optimized code. I just know the code uh, from, uh, from beforehand, and um, we are not very lucky with the code at the moment. We would like to simplify it, but the requirements which we set on ourselves are tr a little bit tricky at this point. Yes. Um, do we actually have an implementation of uh, channels on top of Microsoft code? Uh, we are working on it. So, so we have the. Do you think it's possible? We hope so. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, what we um, so far the coroutines uh, the implementation is done for futures, and the coroutines for um, for channels is, is now the next step. It's a little bit more tricky because of the, the, this pipe structure, but uh, we are working on it. More questions. Okay, then, thank you very much. <laughs>